We have a very um, dense, deep, rich program, and uh, uh, try and try and move it along at a at a, at a good clip here. Um, so um, I'm Sheldon Brown. I'm the director of the the brand spanking new Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination here at UCSD, and uh, I want to welcome all of you. Um, I'm so happy you can join us here at the uh, Qualcomm, Qualcomm Institute of Cal IT2. Um, and this is the capstone event in the inauguration of the new Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. And this past week, we've been holding symposia, lectures, and, com and commemorations to put into practice an idea that has been germinating for years, if not for decades, here at UCSD. And this creation of this center is the convergence of many paths. Um, one of them is the legacy of this university and its particular essence to think deliberately about the invention of the future, seeking further ways to grapple with this inherent, inherently unknowable domain and how it comes about from intentional and accidental outcomes. Um, this character is due in part to our roots as an oceanographic research institute studying that great unknown watery planet that still ho holds as much mystery for us as any other planet in our solar system and beyond. And it is evidenced by this campus minting more of today's contemporary science fiction authors than any other campus in the world. And I, and I wait for some, at the time when someone challenges us on that claim. Um, uh, that will be a, and that will be a great moment. Um, these characteristics were in, were in my mind when I began to think about ways in which the various disciplines of the universities, arts, sciences, humanities, and engineering, might find speculation as a productive basis of interaction. And as one of the co-founders of the institute that we stand in today, I had the Cal IT2, um, we had this great history of making these interactions between these disciplines to take us to unexpected, unexpected vistas and create uh, spectacular outcomes. About the time that I was thinking about, uh, about the creation of a new area of investigation, this area of speculation, the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation had a competitive call to establish the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. And I took the nascent ideas that I had about speculative culture and further developed its engagement with areas such as cognitive neurosciences and space science. And so we were awarded this center to understand, enhance, and enable human imagination and I've been working these past months to pull these pieces together. And all along this process, the involvement of our science fiction writers community has been crucial. David Brin was essential in pulling together this community of authors and provided valuable assistance in creating the proposal. Greg Baer, Werner Vinge, and Kim Stanley Robinson have all been involved in various aspects of our initial activities. And about a year ago, uh, it was about a year ago that Gregory Benford had a thought about holding a symposium here about starships great thought. Um, and it seemed the perfect idea to help us launch the center. Take an idea whose challenge is attenuated at the right levels of ambition, inspiration, and audaciousness. Um, and let's think it through. Um, what would it take to accomplish this? What would be its consequences? How does an idea of this size cause us to examine who we are as a civilization and species and where we might be going? I want to thank James and Gregory Benford for their vision for this symposium and for helping move us a few more steps towards the stars. And I also need to thank a few other people who made this event possible, the Clark Foundation, uh, the chancellor and vice chancellors of the university, Sandra Brown of Research Affairs, Suresh Subramani of Academic Affairs, and Steve Relier of External Relations, the deans of Arts and Humanities and Social Sciences, Seth Lair and Jeff Ellman, Qualcomm Institute Director Ramesh Rao, and Larry Smarr, Director of Cal IT2. There are, so, there are many faculty and staff who have been working diligently to bring this center and this event to life, including the nu numerous faculty involved in the center, such as particularly Associate Director David Kirsch, staff members Vicki DeVries and Carol Hobson, and the students and staff of my uh, game lab. We also have a Founders Orbit of Patrons whose support is making this event possible. Now, the support from various corners of the university and our donors became particularly important to this specific event, as we had been working with, closely with NASA to help sponsor it, but our funding got lost in the budget sequester. Um, so we faced a decision about to help fill this shortfall, 
and in our desire to keep this open to all who are most interested in it, in attending, we kept it free to attend, but here's the, the you know, PBS level plea for your support. And um, so forgive me the, uh, the, the, this pitch, but, uh, but if, you would, if you would like, please go to our webpage, click on Donate Now, and help, and help support this event and future events in this center. Um, so we're, we're really fortunate to have an, 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 just an astounding array of speakers from science, uh, emerging commercial space industry, science fiction, and their, their involvement is testament to the compelling nature of this idea. And I again thank the Benfords for bringing this together this extraordinary forum. And with that, I'll turn it over to Gregory and James Benford. Okay, run it. Yeah, this one? That's no, no. No, no that's that the one. introduction. Yeah, that one. Yeah. <laughs> It's always the AV, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, this uh, symposium is a result of not uh, just of Greg's idea to have it, but of our idea to produce this book, which is released today for the first time. The, the, uh, and I should say, going in, that proceeds from this book, profits from this book, go to interstellar research. So it's a charitable activity. The idea of having a Starship Century Symposium came out because uh, originally we began to realize a few years ago that uh, there was a groundswell of interest in interstellar matters. At this point, five non-governmental organizations exist whose primary focus is interstellar research. That's an interesting development that had not happened before. And what we want to do to keep back to the new slide I was on, the, uh, uh, is uh, bring forth uh, uh, the best thinking we could find about the subject, both from the point of view of science and from the point of view of fiction, uh, including one poem by Jeff Landis. The uh, uh, basic questions, to put them in a more succinct form than Sheldon mentioned them, are these. Is this the century when we first began to build starships? It's starting to look like it. Why go the stars? Can we? Should we? Those are the questions we address today. Do not expect simple answers. Do not expect agreement. But it'll be fun anyway. But first, some cautionary notes about the nature of our reality. This is the scale of the solar system. We've been nestled down here, actually, personally. We, uh, humanity hasn't been any further than just from the Earth to the, to the moon, in the inner solar system is very closely uh, uh, grouped, as you can see here. The basic unit here is the astronomical unit, which is 100 million miles, a long, long way. It's the distance to the sun. Out in the outer solar system, Jupiter's five, uh, five AUs, Saturn is about 10, and they're about 10 AU apart, about a billion miles apart. Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and by the time you get to Pluto, you're way out there at about 50 AUs. It's a big thing, uh, a very big scale, and we've only just begun to explore it robotically, and in terms of, of, of living humans, uh, not at all, really, just to the moon. So, um, the... Uh, the outer solar system has a lot of promise, a lot of interesting phenomena, the Kuiper belt, the Oort or or cloud, and you're going to hear about that this morning and some speculative ways from Freeman Dyson. Uh, the distance out to the, to the stars themselves is absolutely enormous. As you can see, Alpha Centauri is 300,000 AU out, uh, of enormous distance, uh, 4.3 light years. And uh, the other targets in there are going to be the nearer term things that we could possibly send probes to. And that's the scale of what I just told you. And you can see we're way down here at unit one. Uh, Alpha Centauri is up there in astronomical terms, really. And uh, then we've got the heliosphere in here where we interface with the, uh, with the galaxy itself and uh, the interstellar medium, which has not quite been reached, maybe yes, maybe no, by the voyagers. Uh, I seem to be going back. 
Okay. The, uh, now I want to show you a prop. This is a piece of art by a woman named Bathsheba. Is the nearby, is a cube containing the locations of the nearby stars in 3D to scale. The side of this cube is 16 light years. So on this scale, this is the total domain you could imagine uh, human civilization exploring over the next few centuries. Now on this scale, the galaxy itself is this half the distance to the ceiling. It's a thousand light years thick, a far greater distance. And the nearby stars that we're talking about here are, this is a 10 light year uh, scale system, but this, this shows the stars in their 3D configuration. But then you have to think of the more interesting target star where we've recently discovered there is a planet about Alpha C, Alpha Centauri B, rather. And you can see that the scale of the habitable zones shown in, the, in these disks, here's our habitable zone. There's Alpha A, Alpha B, very much like each other. And they have a minimum distance of 11 AU from each other at the closest approach. So it's a very nice neighborhood. Two solar systems for the price of one. Pro Proxima Centauri is much closer to us, 13,000 uh, uh, AUs. But in fact, uh, on the scale of the distance to alpha, it's a small difference. It's probably a white dwarf uh, that's passing through. It's a matter of opinion. Uh, Ian Crawford will talk about that tomorrow morning. The, uh, so that's the nearby target and it'll be quite an achievement to get there. Now, if we think about the galaxy itself, here's a great photograph of the Zodiac in the Milky Way. And the galaxy itself, as I said, is 1,000 light years thick, but it's 100,000 light years across. It's a big pancake-sized thing, and the uh, scale of it is uh, larger, or comparable to the scale of uh, the existence of Homo sapiens in terms of light speed. So it's really the big time, and there are another, there are billions and billions, to quote someone, uh, of those. Now, that's the distance scale. What about speed? To get there, you've got to go very fast. This is a very interesting scale because look at the whole scale. Here's the fastest thing we've ever done, Apollo's. There's the speed of light. If you went back in time to when we were just walking, it would be all the way over against this far wall. So we've made that huge advance, about 10 to the fourth in speed, most of it in the 20th century. And we've got many orders of magnitude to go further. So the velocity change required is enormous, and that's actually the easiest way to look at it. It seems easier if you talk about, well, it's only two or three orders of magnitude, we did that in the 20th century. But it's much more importantly, it becomes an energy question. The, the, rather than go into the, a lot of, uh, about the energy, let me just say this. If you just ask, what's the energy density of a hydrogen bomb in terms of megatonnage per ton of, bomb, of explosive weight? It's about a megaton per ton. A, a starship going at 3.75% of C will have that energy density. Therefore, uh, starships are equivalent to nuclear or supernuclear energy densities. So the, that's the scale of the thing you have to do to get really going. What that says, first of all, simple lesson, keep the mass down. <laughs> Since energy goes as V squared, the one thing you have to get is V, but you can reduce M, and that becomes a problem for the rockets, as we will see later today. Now, Predictions are hard to do, and most people are not willing to do them. But Freeman Dyson did 45 years ago in his prescient article in Physics Today, a, a, a renowned journal, my favorite magazine, edited at that time by Gloria uh, Lubkin, who is with us here. And the article was written by Freeman Dyson, who is also with us here. Now we'll tell you. Freeman, what you said then. <laughs> I predict that in about 200 years from now, barring a catastrophe, the first interstellar voyages will begin. 
Well, we're almost, <laughs> we're, approaching, uh, we're approaching a quarter of that time now. Dyson has doubled in age. And perhaps later today we might hear what he thinks about the matter now. Now let's look at another aspect. How do people think about star travel, space travel, and those sorts of things? And this is the fun part of the talk. The techno-progress view, which many people hold, especially many people here, is to see human history as a progress from the wheel to the ship to the locomotive to the airplane to the rocket, and then the starship is the next thing. Okay, now that's one view, not extremely widely held, but it's had a narrative, as they say in the universities these days. But there is another view, <laughs> the near-term view that says, what, are we, what about today? What about today? And, and, and where's dinner, right? <laughs> it's one of those persistent things that happens to dreamers. People keep knocking, tapping you on the shoulder and talking about reality. Um, but there is another view. And that is, let's fix everything here before we go anywhere else. And this is, uh, I got this from the National Space Society. Now, this is not an, uh, a new controversy at all. This slide is 40 years old. <laughs> We've been talking about this for a long time. And the argument here is, let's get out there and make use of new resources. This afternoon is devoted to that aspect because we're not getting to the stars until we get to the solar system in a real sense and start to tap the energy materials that come from that. So, uh, and then finally, there is the ever-present uh, bifurcation. Uh, people who hold these two different views seem to want to marry each other. They, one view says, hey, there's lots of interesting stuff out there. Let's get going. What are we waiting for? And then somebody else says, can I hit the snooze button here? Uh, you know, I, I, you know uh, I got my ever-present realities. And, and so here I am telling you about that, and my wife is watching this by streaming and back at the hotel. OK, so that's what I had to say. And Greg wants to talk now about how we have viewed the frontier in our past. Right. This is what the United States looked like at the moment of signing <coughs> the Louisiana Purchase. Our, Thomas Jefferson really did say that in that year. He was of an order of magnitude, as we shall see. <laughs> um, we might be too. Notice that the, the, this place was owned by the Spaniards at this point. Uh, Texas, soon enough, took away a piece of it from Mexico, and then we took away the rest of the West from Mexico. And, but the point is, it was only a year or two uh, since this invention. This is the first locomotive. And this is exactly what was wrong with Jefferson's argument. He didn't foresee that this technology would unite this continent in much less than 100 years. He just did not foresee that the combination of coal, the steam engine, the locomotive, and the railroad would change perspectives on distance. And then followed metal sailing ships, metal driven ships, the Panama Canal, and much else. So that these kinds of things can occur. But there's almost always, <laughs> occasionally, what was that saying? Mistakes were made. Uh, this is in France, not, not here, so. <laughs> so this is, um, this is the approximate problem, an another picture of how far away it is to get. The whole point, though, is that we can get there if we build the infrastructure to fill in that solar system. That's the topic of this afternoon. Um, and I believe that there, you can immediately now identify three technologies that we really need to push in order to, to make space become profitable and verse, eventually inhabitable. And there are these three technologies. And I think the combination of them will allow firms such as interplanetary resources or planetary resources to actually make a profit out of mounting asteroids and so on and therefore to extend our reach in that way. But there are always going to be problems sending humans. <laughs> um, uh, Rick Lovett made this up. It's uh, 
from his uh, delightful story in the book. Um, these are just a few of the little things that can go wrong. Uh, notice that you don't encounter any of these dangers sitting here in this auditorium. Uh, <laughs> but you're going to have to worry about all of this every moment when you're in the inherently hostile and radioactive environment of outer space. By the, by the way, uh, the fears about using nuclear rockets, as Jeff Landis pointed out <laughs> to me long ago, are kind of not germane because the space is already radioactive, right? It's full of <laughs> ionized uh, and uh, dangerous particles. But some people are willing to go. So people, if you think you've got problems, <laughs> uh, this is a guy who wanted to get into space and did it, despite incredible problems. And he too is in the book. And so I would leave you with one last admonition. <laughs> Here's a Voyager, you know, on its way, innocently, and then this thing turns up. Um, we, the one thing that I, I think we can all agree on is that in the expansion of humanity into the solar system and then eventually to the stars, we have to expect the unexpected. Thanks, and now we'll open the program. <laughs> Next up is Peter Schwartz, who is uh, not as well known in the interstellar-oriented community as he should be. He's a futurist. He is a uh, he uh, didn't luck out in the asteroid finals and uh, in uh, 1969, I think it was. And so he decided, since he hadn't really planned for another future, perhaps he ought to start to study the future and became a futurist. Uh, I think he's uh, one of the most brilliant people around, and he's had a long history of, of, of right calls about things. And so he's going to talk to us about his view of uh, the possibilities for the existence of starships uh, by considering a var variety of scenarios for them coming into existence or not. So uh, let's welcome Peter Schwartz.